All right. Hello, Greg. How you doing today? Good. Nice to be here, Chris. Yeah, I'm, I'm super glad we get to talk. I've been really curious about this topic and I think about it a ton. But first, before we dive into it, uh, the book that we're mainly going to be talking about is Rejecting Retributivism, right? Yeah. So uh, this, this book is a, a little bit older. You actually have a recent book, Just Desserts. But mm -hmm. can you kind of explain what Re uh, rejecting retributivism is kind of about what the idea is in a larger context for those who don't know? Sure, yeah. So retributivism is one of the leading justifications for punishment in the criminal justice system. So I'm primarily concerned with legal punishment, institutional punishment, when the government punishes criminals or wrongdoers. And so retributivism um, basically maintains that absent any excusing conditions like, you know, insanity or some other sort of mitigating circumstances, wrongdoers morally deserve to be punished in proportion to their wrongdoing. So mm -hmm. the, the basic idea is wrongdoers uh, deserve something bad to happen to them um, because they knowingly done wrong. And that in can include everything from pain, deprivation, loss of liberty, all the way up to say the death penalty. Um, but the, the idea of retributivism is grounded in, in basically two sort of really important philosophical notions. The mm -hmm. idea of just deserts, that individuals justly deserve to sort of suffer for the wrongs they've done, where dessert here is not what we have after dinner, it's not deserts, it's yeah. the idea that the, it's punishment one deserves. Yeah. Um, and this also kind of entails that the punishment is justified on purely backward looking um, grounds, that is, the punishment is somehow intrinsically morally good. It's good without reference to some other forward-looking benefits like deterrence mm -hmm. or moral formation or to make society better. So the idea is that just wrongdoers deserve to be punished in proportion to their wrongdoing, regardless of whether it would have any of these forward-looking benefits. Um, yeah. And this has been both historically and presently one of the leading justifications for punishment in the criminal justice system. And so in the book, um, it's basically broken into two main halves with like one transitional chapter. The first mm -hmm. half of the book lays out um, six distinct arguments against mm -hmm. retributivism, why we should reject it. Um, two of them, and a large focus of the book has to do with issues to do with free will and moral responsibility. Um, and then the second half of the book is my attempt to offer an alternative, yeah. an alternative to not only um, retributive punishment, but to um, other non-retributive alternatives like deterrence and um, mixed theories of punishment. I argue that there are some moral complications with some of the other leading alternatives. And so I attempt to develop a non-punitive and non-retributive approach called the public health quarantine model. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is something like, as I just kind of, you know, even think about the other side, it's something I'm really passionate about. So to lay it out and, and I so on Twitter, one day, I was like, hey, I'd love to talk about free will and the justice system. And I was like, you know, what? Greg talks about this. I'm like, hey, we want to do it. And, and we connected. But the reason being so I got sober in 2012. So I have nine years sober. And I was a terrible human being, right? Like awful, just, you know, drugs, alcohol, I live here in Vegas. And, you know, I'm the son of an alcoholic mom, right? She got sober when I was 20. Uh, mental illness runs through my family. You know, I've worked in rehab. I've worked with so many people who have, you know, all these, all these factors outside of their control, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and aside aside from that, like aside from the free will conversation, like you're talking about like, you know, uh, the, the, the punishment aspect, right? And the deterrence. And, you know, I have read so many books and I just love to read and learn and stuff. And I have yet to find any evidence that punishment works mm -hmm. as a deterrent. And, you know, especially with like the prison industrial complex, how it, it, get, it keeps people in the prison system. Like sure, they don't really yeah. have any, you know, so that's one of the reasons why I'm just like, Ugh, I want to talk about this. So, yeah. um, so when, when you're looking at this, I'm, I'm kind of curious just to get to know you, Greg, like sure. what, what made you interested in this topic? Like, you know, like I was interested because I was looking at the world and I've had all these experiences. Like, was all it right. something similar? Like, did you see some issues or? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's hard to always diagnose or analyze how one ends up sort of interested in the things they're interested in. But 
Um, I was always interested in issues to do with agency, free will, and moral responsibility. Um, and so I came to my views on free will first. So just for the listeners, um, I'm a free will skeptic. So I maintain mm. that who we are, what we do is ultimately the result of factors beyond our control. And because of this, we're never morally responsible in a very specific sense, what I call the basic dessert sense, the sense that would make you truly deserving of praise and blame and punishment and reward. Um, it's exactly the kind of moral responsibility that's required for retributivism. So by rejecting this notion of free will, that offers one reason for rejecting retributivism. Um, but I also started to get really interested in criminal justice in part for a couple of reasons. You know, I had, um, I had I have five older brothers, two of them also struggled, uh, struggled with drug addiction. Mm -hmm. um, I also saw how much of the, you know, um, criminal justice system is a byproduct of social features that it has less to do with um, individuals and more to do with circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so the more you begin to look at the role that luck plays in outcomes, it got me really interested in thinking about issues of, of justice and, and in particular issues of, of criminal justice. Um, and then you start looking at, you know, and then I, this is all sort of stuff that's become part of the consciousness, but only more recently, this mass incarceration crisis we have in the United States. I mean, mm -hmm. we make, we have up only about United States makes up only about 4.5% of the world's population. That's a relatively small part of the overall population, but mm -hmm. we house 25% of the world's prisoners. That's the largest rate of incarceration known to civilization. No other society um, that we know of um, and you know, in re on record has ever incarcerated that many people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's disproportionately affected black and brown communities. Um, and you actually like, you know, and maybe you could talk about this with your own experience. At this point, you know, people are starting to be touched by the criminal justice system because um, one out of every 31 Americans, just think about this, one out of every 31 Americans is somewhere in the criminal justice system, mm. whether it's probation, parole, jail, prison. Um, that's a huge number of individuals <clears throat> being drawn into a system. And then you start asking, well, what's the purpose of this system? Is yeah. it producing the outcomes we really want? Is it making us safer? Is it the best way to deal with issues having to do with you know, drug addiction and mental illness? Um, and so those issues sort of got me into searching into the causes and the social factors, what I call the social determinants of criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. And the more you begin to analyze those social determinants of criminal behavior, the more you begin to realize they're very similar to things like the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like things like poverty, low socioeconomic status, abuse, domestic violence, uh, housing, especially housing insecurity, mental illness, healthcare, um, education, environmental health, nutrition. Mm -hmm. We all know intuitively that those things have an effect on health outcomes. Like um, people who live in poverty have higher rates of morbidity, higher rates of type 2 diabetes, um, mm -hmm. higher rates of heart disease. But we also see, once you look closely, that they also have higher incarceration rates. Mm -hmm. um, and the same is true with low socioeconomic status, higher rates of abuse and domestic violence. So just think of this one statistic, 85 to 90 percent of women who are currently imprisoned in the United States have been um, themselves previously victims of abuse. Yeah. 85 to 90%. So that's either sexual assault, rape, child abuse, um, some form of physical violence has been perpetrated on them. And mm -hmm. the more you begin to look into the lives of those who find themselves within the criminal justice system, it's very hard to draw this line between criminal and a victim and perpetrator because almost all of the individuals who find themselves in the system were themselves victims at one yeah. point or another. And you begin to think then that if, if, it's, if it's, you know, is it, is it the best way to go about, you know, blaming individuals um, and seeking, you know, retributive punishment on women who were abused because the abuse affects them in such a way that they ultimately begin, you know, end up engaging in, in criminal behavior. And, the, and one of the reasons is in part is that either they, it's usually co-addiction. So mm -hmm. usually, so you have a combination of violence within a relationship, you're compounded with 
um, a, you know, a co-addictive, you know, partner. And so they might commit criminal acts, petty crimes to feed their, their habit. It might be that they commit criminal acts in retaliation to their abuser, mm -hmm. or in, in many other cases, it's that, and we know this, the psychological effects of abuse, that women who are abused have a harder time holding full-time jobs. It creates a psychological, you know, like post-traumatic stress effect on individuals, which has a big impact on their daily, you know, functioning. Mm -hmm. And so they have higher rates of unemployment. And if you're unemployed, you can't hold a job, you're yeah. going to end up resorting to petty crimes to get by. And so is the right approach to dealing with these kinds of cases, um, you know, punishment and retribution, or is it to better to address what I would call the social determinants of crime, um, and focus on prevention and social justice. That is fixing the systemic causes of criminal behavior in the first place, <clears throat> rather than punishing individuals on the tail end. Yeah, yeah. So last last year, I don't know what what sparked it. I think some of it was like you know uh, you know everything around like the Black Lives Matter protests and you know George Floyd and all that, but. I was looking at, you know, systems and I got really interested in that and I started diving into the idea of like meritocracy, right? And, you know, I, I started thinking about it more because I, I was this, you know, I was this person uh, mainly because of my addiction recovery. I'm like, I worked hard, I put in the effort, I got sober, right? And then I was like, oh, there was a lot of things that really went my way. Like my mom was seven years sober when I got sober, right? She paid for me to go into sober living. These are a lot of advantages that a lot of people don't yeah. have. Yeah. And uh, I actually recently spoke with Robert Frank about his book, Success and Luck, right? And that's when I, I you know, his book and many others, I started learning about, you know, just things like uh, John Rawls, like veil of ignorance, right? Yeah. And, and just, there's so many things outside of our control and, like kind of like what you're talking about, like we have so much data, right? We have so much data around people from certain backgrounds and, you know, areas and stuff who are at these higher rates. And, and then we know too, like you were mentioning, uh, you know, holding the, the, it's difficult to hold down a job. Well, also you mentioned like, you know, looking at like, Hey, is the prison even helping when people get out of prison, right? They have this, this mark on them. Right, so it's even it's still hard to get a job, and then when you uh, factor in probation, parole, it's difficult to socialize, and it's difficult to do all these other things. So I guess one of my first questions, like about this, is like as you're explaining this, right? Like I hear you, and I feel like I'm a sane person, Greg. You're making sense to me, so I'm trying to understand how does anybody look at the data, the numbers, the logic behind this and say, no, no, that person who got abused and, you know, had all these terrible things in life, we need to shove them in a cell. Like, what is the counter argument? What is the logic behind that? Yeah, I think so, you know, it gets philosophical. I mean, I'm a philosopher. So yeah. I do think um, at bottom, the kind of mentality we have, especially in the United States, this kind of rugged individualism mm. that is very prevalent throughout the United States, um, lead, leads us to see individuals as morally accountable and, 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 and seeing criminal behavior as the result of individual actions. And so if you see it all in terms of the issue of free will and individual responsibility, then you tend to have this idea of a meritocracy and that people could pick themselves up from the bootstraps and, mm -hmm. and overcome poverty or prior abuse or um, you know, homelessness or whatever hurdles they, they were presented with. Individuals have the free will to, to choose to do good or do evil. Now, part of, you know, so let me get step back. I mean, I, I, I offer a number of different arguments, both in this book and, and many of my other works, of, for why we should be free will skeptics. And, and I don't want to get overly complicated uh, um, for the non-experts out there, but <laughs> I mean, there's two, there's two general routes. One is, is more technical, but basically it stems from the idea of what's called hard incompatibilism. And it's the idea that um, whether determinism is true or indeterminism is true, um, we would lack the kind of control and action required for individuals to be free and morally responsible in the sense required. What I call mm -hmm. the basic dessert sense, the sense that would make you truly deserving of praise and blame mm -hmm. and and reward. And this gets into longstanding traditional debates about free will. Let me just say for the for those who don't know, determinism is the thesis that every event or action, including 
human actions are the inevitable result of preceding events and actions in combination with the laws of nature. So it's the idea that um, facts about the remote past in conjunction with the laws of nature entail as only one fixed future. Yeah, quick uh, question. Did you did you watch that show Devs that came out like yeah, last year? Yeah, I did. Year? Yeah, it was yeah. really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it it was. raises the, obviously questions about determinism and free will. That's, so that's where I learned about it. <laughs> the historical yeah. argument, you know, is that if determinism is true, it seems to be a challenge to free will because individuals either wouldn't be able to do otherwise, because if determinism is true, the only thing that occurs is the only thing that could have occurred. Um, or that individuals are at the ultimate source of their actions because the sourcehood drains back to antecedent conditions, upbringing, yeah. past, um, how they were raised, what kinds of experiences they had, all the way back to even before they were born. Yeah. But then part of my argument is that even if you introduce indeterminacy, that's not going to preserve free will either um, because it doesn't give the agent the ability to control the outcomes. Just introducing random indeterminacy is, is not going to preserve the agent's ability to settle what outcome uh, mm -hmm. actually you know, uh, occurs. Yeah. It could get more complicated here and there are arguments like compatibilism, but let me, just, let me just add one other thing, and this is more to your point. I also say, regardless of all of the metaphysical stuff about determinism and quantum mechanics or indeterminism, mm -hmm. um, the issue of luck is, 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 is huge here. And so there's a separate argument developed by a uh, philosopher, well, a number of philosophers, but most recently, um, Neil Levy defends it in a book called Hard Luck, um, which is the idea that you know, luck swallows all. So the basic idea is that there's two kinds of luck that's relevant here. I mean, there are other kinds that other philosophers identify, but there's constitutive luck, which is the kind of luck that makes you the person you are, that, that constitutes your character, your, your psychological predisposition. So these are matters of luck, like, and you mentioned Rawls. Rawls is a big proponent of this. Part of the idea of Rawls is actually to come up with a theory of justice not grounded in desert, because he was perhaps one of the first to be really aware of this idea that a lot of these factors are just contingencies of birth. You know, who you're born to, mm -hmm. whether you're born into a white family, a black family, rich or poor, whether you're born with a learning disability, or whether you have mental health issues. These are not things you earn. These are not things you deserve. Um, and so in a certain sense, you know, we should have a kind of approach to justice that doesn't, doesn't, you know, penalize people for bad luck. It doesn't automatically reward people for things that weren't ultimately within their control. Yeah. So the constitutive luck is the kind of luck that makes you who you are. It's the kind of circumstances that shape you as an individual. And then there's what we could call present luck, luck around the time of action. And this is the kind of luck mm. of what thoughts to come, come to me in that particular moment, what reasons I find most salient. Um, but could also be the luck of, you know, um, you know, whether, um, you know, I meet someone on a park bench or a suspension bridge, yeah. the color of the wall, all of these things could affect my choices in ways I'm unaware of. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea is that the combination of constitutive luck and present luck ultimately swallow all and undermine moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned even in your own recovery that, yeah, there's effort, but A, there's, there are big factors of luck that helped you succeed, right? You had maybe a support system. You had your mm -hmm. mother who'd already recovered. You had people who could afford to send you to rehab. Um, and then there's the kind of luck of, that made you the person who could put the effort in, could overcome, or yeah. could or fail to come. And those are factors of constitutive luck. Um, and so the, the idea is that whether it be present luck or constitutive luck, um, our actions are always being affected by factors beyond our control. Whether those factors are determinism, whether those factors are randomness, or whether those factors are luck, my argument is that who we are and what we do is ultimately a result of these factors that we don't control. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we don't have the kind of moral responsibility that would be needed to justify this kind of punishment. Yeah, it's, and I think one of the reasons I find it, you know, just the whole conversation so interesting is, is because like, I guess one one quick question I have, right? When we're talking about the things outside of our control and like being skeptical of free will, like I, I, like, I don't know if I'm just like not thinking about it correctly yet, but 
is it is this like an absolute 100% thing or are there gray areas? So for example, right, uh, I've been sober for nine years. If I, if I said, hey, Greg, I'm leaving, I live in Las Vegas, I could go down the street, get alcohol, whatever, right, and relapse, right? There was a series of decisions that I made, right? So, you know, uh, I worked, you know, when I was working at a rehab with, you know, addicts and everything like that, you know, I, I try to give them this kind of agency and say, hey, this is up to you. Like when you leave this treatment center, if you go to meetings, if you follow up with your mental health, you know, whether it's a therapist or psychiatrist, if you decide to take your meds, like, so there's, there's all of those, right? But at the same time, I also get that, you know, uh, maybe, maybe the person just wasn't born with that kind of will, that drive, that, you know, whatever some of those little factors are. So, so yeah, the question is, like, is there a balance or is it like, no, no, free will is just non-existent? Well, I mean, you have to look at the arguments. I'm not going to tell people that, you know, uh, ultimately that they should, they should decide, decide this because of what I say. But my view, my view is that the way, the best way to get to the conclusion that it's all inclusive is the idea that, well, look at all the other alternative accounts that try to make sense of free will. And my argument would be, once you look at them closely, you'll see that they fail for various reasons. And because all of the other leading accounts fail, as a default, I argue that free will skepticism is the only rational position to adopt. Mm. Um, and it's because when you look at, you look at the ways that the other theories try to preserve it, there's one approach that tries to just introduce you know, random uh, or indeterminacy at the level of events. Well, I would argue that's not going to preserve free will because it leaves the agent unable to settle which outcome. There's one way that you can preserve free will by bringing in an agent who is capable of being like an uncaused cause, capable of generating their own actions, devoid of antecedent events, um, have certain causal powers. But this view requires a kind of set of metaphysical commitments. I would argue is hard to justify and reconcile with our best scientific theories about the world. Mm -hmm. And then the last view is this kind of compatibilist view that says, well, you can be determined and free at the same time. Mm. Um, it, and it, it's a matter of, of whether or not the action is coerced or uncoerced or whether mm. the agent is, has certain capacities of reasons, responsiveness. My response to those views is that, look, all of those things matter. And just like you said, when you're working with other um, uh, patients and other clients, you do want to stress agency. You want to stress the ability that your actions matter, your choices matter. I'm not denying that. What I would deny is that the whether agents are reasons responsive or not is not a factor they ultimately control. How reasons responsive they are is not a factor they ultimately control. The mm -hmm. choices they make are the result of inner psychological states. Well, those inner psychological states themselves are the result of factors beyond their control. Mm. Hereditary factors, environmental factors, factors about how you know, they were raised, what kinds of experiences they had as a child, what kinds of social circumstances they've been exposed to, and all those other things I mentioned, whether they were raised in poverty, low socioeconomic, mm -hmm. exposed to violence, those things will have a big in impact on on their inner psychology and how they think and how they weigh and how they make decisions. So yes, they're making decisions. Yes, they're they're choosing to act in certain ways. But my argument would be the choices themselves are the causal result of factors beyond their ultimate mm. control. Now, of course, we could intervene, and that's partly what you do as a as a counselor, or that's partly what I do as a teacher. Um, or that's partly what people do as parents. They intervene to try to alter those mm. inner scales so that people make different choices moving forward. Um, but that, that itself would be the result of what I would call antecedent causes, mm. that my interventions themselves were causes and those causes have effects. So the idea is ultimately you can't escape this, this, this web of cause and effect um, and that everything is gonna have causal antecedents that you know, drain back the factors the agent really can't control themselves. And then you have the additional factors about luck and how mm -hmm. heavily luck matters. Um, 
but yeah, I don't want to go on. on yeah, that. no, I, I, I think about, you know, I, I just see a lot of luck. For example, I've had clients reach out to me and be, you know, years later and be like, hey, you really helped me or whatever. And I often talk about, you know, when I share my story and stuff, I'm like, there's people who said things, just randomly said something in a meeting, changed my life. It stuck with me. It's a new life philosophy I live by. And it's like the chance encounter that I was in the same room with them. They happened to say that thing. Uh, you know, if you have students and you change their lives, you know, they got you as a teacher and whatever led them to going to that, you know, school and all these other things, right? So I, I got a question for you. This, this goes a little bit more towards the political side. And, and I'm trying, I ask a lot of people this because I'm trying to figure it out. I am, I'm trying to find an excellent argument for just leaving capitalism intact, okay? Because it seems, it seems like, because we're in this idea of like the meritocracy and you work hard, you rise to the top and we have a free market and you can do all this, then it trickles down to even things like the justice system. So I guess what I'm getting at is it feels like when we're living in a, in a culture where we're, we're instilling in people that if you work hard, you can get the results that you want, you're in control. So then when we look at something like the justice system, even though it seems something different, because of that idea of individualism, that same kind of idea goes over there and says, no, you could have worked hard. You could have gone to, you know, who cares if you grew up in a crappy neighborhood? You live in America, the land of the free. You could have worked hard and busted your ass and all these other things. So, so yeah, my question, like, do you, do you see that kind of being an effect trickling yeah, all so over the place? I, I don't want to get too macro because then sometimes it gets too connected <laughs> from, from the, the subtleties of these debates, but I do yeah. go there. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there's several things to say here. I mean, one, yes, I do think there's a linkage between different political ideologies and different attitudes toward free will and different attitudes toward responsibility and different attitudes toward dessert. Um, and I do think, um, so let me even say, uh, let me, I'll go one by one. There's, a, there's empirical evidence that supports this, this view that, for example, um, the stronger one's belief in free will, the stronger... Um, one's belief in something called uh, just world belief or belief in a yeah. just world. Also stronger, it turns out, the stronger one's belief in what's called right-wing authoritarianism. Um, so there seems to be a cluster of views that fit very nicely with this kind of conservative attitude towards economics and towards um, uh, the belief in a just world. So the idea of a belief in a just world is simply the world is just and good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And it, this sounds like an innocuous kind of belief, but um, psychologists have been studying it for decades. And what they've found is that it ultimately is a pernicious idea because it turns into a blame the victim approach. Yeah. So I'll give you a couple examples. I mean, one very famous example is rape victims. So mm -hmm. for example, a woman who's raped, well, that's a horrific event. You can't imagine something more horrific happening to an individual. And in a just world, such a bad thing would never happen to a good person. So to preserve the belief in a just world, you flip the script and you somehow blame the victim. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why um, defense attorneys will question the integrity of the woman. They do it because it works. And it works because people have this unconscious desire to preserve the belief in a just world. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea, well, she was dressed provocatively, or she was walking where she shouldn't be walking, or she was intoxicated, and that's her responsibility. That's a way to blame the victim. Um, mm -hmm. But the reason you need to blame the victim is um, because they're trying to preserve this idea that only you know bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. Now, in our sober, more reflective moments, we can see that the world is not just. And, you know, the lottery of life is not always fair. and Bad things happen to good people all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But this unconscious desire in, in, to preserve this belief, I think, is very closely related to the idea of free will, in part because it's very closely allied with the idea of individual effort and meritocracy and desert. And so not only do we blame rape victims um, for their own uh, victimhood, we blame those in poverty for somehow failing to work hard. They're lazy, mm -hmm. they're mooches, they're, they, they have the opportunity, but they fail to take use of it. We blame those who are incarcerated for the circumstances that got them incarcerated. We blame those who suffer from educational inequity 
by saying that somehow it's their parents fault or the child or the students fault themselves. Mm -hmm. And so this preserves this kind of ideology, I think, which is very strong in capitalism because it drives this in, this um, inherent um, belief that um, it is all a matter of effort and individual accomplishment. Mm -hmm. There's actually a really good example. I think I might mention it either in this book or the book with Dan Dennett. Um, and it's, it references this speech that um, Obama gave. So Obama was giving a speech in front of a number, uh, an audience of successful business owners. Mm -hmm. and, and this blew up, it became a major issue. He said that, um, well, if you, if you succeeded in business, you didn't build it alone. You didn't build it yourself. That somewhere along the way you had help. You mm -hmm. had an encouraging teacher or a supportive parent or someone that lended you money to get your business started yeah. or a small business loan from the local you know, uh, business organization or some, some issues along the way, some factors of luck, some, some things went your way and you didn't do it alone. And it really upset people with this very individualistic, conservative kind of um, cause a sui, you know, lifting yourself from the bootstraps kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the it was a presidential election that year. They ran the Republican National Convention that year, at least two of the nights around the slogan, yes, we did. Like, mm -hmm. yes, we did. We built it ourselves. And I was trying to think just like you, why did they find this claim so so insulting, so yeah. radically, you know, controversial. Because the next sentence Obama said is like, look, if you succeeded in business, you didn't do it alone. You had some help, you had some support, you had, you know, loved ones that were behind you. That just seems factually correct to me. But I think it was such a, um, um, such a re resistant idea to the right in part because it, it, it gets right to the core of this question of desert. Mm -hmm. that individuals get what they deserve. If I yeah. succeed, it's because of my own efforts. And if, it's, if I fail, it's because of your lack of effort or your failure of effort. Yeah. And so, and if you see, it's like, if you have a nail, everything, if you have a hammer, everything looks like yeah. a nail. If you approach everything through the lens of individual, um, you know, individualism or individual responsibility, then the right response to crime is punitive, to mm -hmm. punish it. Because it's not about the circumstances, it's about the individual. Yeah. Um, but all of those things tie together. And that's why I, that some of my work, um, I do attempt to, to draw a connection between these larger, um, you know, um, these larger socio um, political kind of beliefs, yeah. like belief in a just world, right wing authoritarianism, religiosity. These things all seem to cluster very closely. The stronger the belief in free will, the stronger the a cluster, the cluster of these other beliefs. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of evidence for that. Also, seems to be a lot of evidence for the belief that the stronger one believes in free will, um, the more punitive they are. That is, they desire more punitive responses to, to wrong mm. and bad behavior. Mm. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because yeah. if you think the individual is free, then you think they're responsible, and the right response is to punish them. But I would say not only are there these philosophical problems with retribution and these philosophical problems um, you know, around free will, I don't think we have it. So I don't think we have the kind of dessert that would justify it. Also going back to what you said at the beginning, I also think it's ineffective. It just doesn't work. Yeah. And so for example, we have the highest rate of incarceration known in mankind. We, we incarcerate roughly 700 people for every 100,000 people. Compare that to say Norway, Denmark, Sweden, they, they imprison roughly 60 people for every 100,000. So we literally imprison more than 10 times as many people. Yeah. And we have poor results to show for it. We have one of the highest rates of recidivism in the world. Mm -hmm. So for example, 76.6% of prisoners who are released will be rearrested within the first five years of release. So nearly 80% of people who go to prison and come out are going to go right back in. Yeah. Whereas you look at Norway and Denmark and, and, and some of the Scandinavian approaches, they have a much lower crime rate. They have a much lower incarceration rate, and they have one of the lowest rates of recidivism in the world, only 20%. Mm -hmm. Recidivism is repeat crime. People who yeah. go to prison committing. And part of the reason is, the focus of the criminal justice system. So for us, the focus of the criminal justice system is punitive. 
Mm -hmm. It's to punish the individual. It's to give them their just desserts. And if you view, if you view the goal of, of prisons or the, goal, the role of uh, the criminal justice system as punitive, well, then you don't want to educate these people. You don't want to give them drug treatment. Mm -hmm. You don't want to provide them with um, you know, mental health services. You don't want to provide them with books and, and things to improve their lives. Because, well, that's just luxuries. We, they're there to be punished, right? Yeah. Punished upon their crimes. In, in the Scandinavian approach, they, they actually see the goal differently. The purpose of, of imprisonment is rehabilitation and then reintegration. Yeah. And over 90% of prisoners, in, in, or 90% of people who are convicted in Norway serve less than a year. Yeah. So yeah. the vast majority of people are going to serve nothing, no time at all or less than a year in prison. Whereas mm -hmm. we not only incarcerate more people than any other nation, we incarcerate them in some of the, the poorest conditions in the world and for some of the longest periods of time. Um, yeah. We have some of the lengthiest sentences out there. And it's not making us safer. It's not reducing crime. It's not um, benefiting the individuals. Um, in part because, you know, again, um, our, our, the, let me just, I know I'm going on here, but this is- No, no, I love it. <laughs> and, um, our prisons have become de facto mental health institutions. Yeah. So more than 50% of people who are currently in prison in the United States suffers from a mental illness. Mm -hmm. I have some statistics here. 64% of jailed inmates um, have a diagnosable mental illness, 54% of state prisoners. Among women, it's it's even greater, 75% of women yeah. have diagnosable mental illnesses. So the part of the reason for that is that we deinstitutionalized um, our mental health um, institutions because, well, there was a lot of abuse in them, but that yeah. was supposed to be step one in a two-step process where we then reinvested in other mental health mm -hmm. services. But we never did that. We just closed down the psych wards and we never invested in, in mental health. And as a consequence, these people are now being housed in our criminal justice system, mm -hmm. whereas many of these people would be better served with mental health services. Many of the people, vast majority of the people in prison are in prison because of low, low level drug possession or crimes committed due to drug addiction. Yeah. Most of them would be better served with, um, with, with drug addiction um, or rehabilitation, um, mm -hmm. um, drug treatment, I, I meant to say options instead of incarceration. Incarceration yeah. in most cases exasperates the problem because people who are incarcerated are separated from their loved ones. They, they lose whatever employment they had. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to regain employment upon release. Many of them um, end up falling into homelessness and there's this revolving door of homelessness. Yeah. The people who are homeless are more likely to become incarcerated. The people who are incarcerated are more likely to find themselves in conditions of homelessness. So yeah. there's this cycle. And ultimately, it sets people up for failures. And it disproportionately sets up you know, black and brown communities yeah. for failure because those communities have been more devastated than any others from the mass incarceration crisis. Yeah, it, it it's wild too because you know, like like you were saying, like we've been doing we've we've been doing this for years. It's been going on for years, and you look back, and if you look at any of the statistics or whatever, like our crime rates, you know, dropping tremendously, like like and and especially crime, crime rates are going down, and incarceration rates have not modeled, it's not followed. In fact, they continue to increase. It's yeah. Really, so yeah. what's weird is is that you know in in this you know system where you know we're all about like business and profits and stuff like if you were looking if i owned a company and i looked at it i'm like hey like something's not adding up here like it seems like you would look at the data and then you would look at your competitor maybe like you know norway or sweden or whatever and say well their rates are a lot better what are they doing right yeah. so then i started thinking about you know like like how much of it is just you know with our with our prison system is it is it like ego right i think about that with like uh, uh healthcare too like are we just like too much ego to say like hey maybe we should do what they're doing because it seems to be you know working better but but yeah i uh, uh a couple of years ago when i got canceled on youtube i got really into human irrationality that's why i love the book too because you, you you have cognitive science in there too because i look at the world i'm like how does this even make sense to you like what what are you doing right and like you mentioned like the just world idea and and 
I've come to kind of realize it's just, it feels like part of our human nature is that we're control freaks, right? We don't want to believe that anybody can get raped, right? We don't want to believe that anybody could become an addict. We don't want to believe that you switch a few lucky situations and you might've become that person or, you know, yeah. whatever, right? Well, Whether it's- If you were in that situation, you would be that person. I mean- Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very, it's, so that's an interesting, it's very hard for people to come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. Because I think a, especially why can't the US follow other country models like with universal healthcare or with approaches to criminal justice, I think is in part, we just have a radically individualized culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's built in, as you say, into our economic system. It's built into our politics. It's built into the psyche. And yeah. I don't know enough about why that is. I mean, it might have to do with westward expansion. It might just have to do with the kind of individualism that was needed to survive in early America. It might have to do, but we are much more of a, are an individualistic society where many European nations are much more collective. Yeah. And there are even Asian countries that are, are even more so in regards to when a crime occurs, they see it not only not as a failure of the individual, but really as a failure of the society, mm. that somehow society failed that individual by yeah. not providing with the, with, the, with, the, with the net of support that's necessary that they had to resort to crime. Um, yeah. And that's why individuals see like this as a, like a, um, a you know, a, um, a, a negative plight on the family or reflective of the family. It's not just that person who committed the crime, somehow the whole family is is impugned because somehow we're all responsible yeah america doesn't have that kind of mentality and so um i don't again i don't know really the the sort of uh the anthropological or, yeah. or sociological reasons for how that came to be but the the ex the fact is we are now you know very strongly individualistic and we don't like to see luck playing such a big role but there are there are certain things that are just undeniable. So for example, um, I'll just give you a sports example um, because it's, this is an example from Michael, um, uh, sorry, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. I um, loved it, yeah. Yeah, and so in the book, um, he uses the analogy of NHL hockey players and he studied their, their birth dates and found, I'll try to do, they found some weird, um, bell curve and it was something like you know january and february like the birthdays all sort of fell like within those two months like, yeah. yeah you might have a july person who makes it to the nhl um but for some weird anomalous reason the vast majority i don't know if it was 70 percent or higher but it was a good portion of the players that made it to the professional ranks had birthdays in these two months and i was like how could that be um, it can't be statistically explained because it's far outside the realm of chance. Yeah. Um, and what he discovered was that many of them come from Canada. They're born with like a hockey stick in their hands. And many of them start playing in the peewee leagues. Like I'm talking three, four, five years old. As soon as they can walk, they're put on mm -hmm. skates, right? And it just turns out that the cutoff date for the peewee leagues had it that if you were born in these two months, you would be the oldest in the league. Now you could be someone who's born a day after, but you're put in the, the lower league, right? Yeah. Or the, the next league. And so the idea was, um, imagine being four or five years old and being nearly 12 months developmentally superior to the kid next to you on the skates. You yeah. have better hand-eye coordination. You're literally a year bigger. So you're stronger, more coordinated. And so you do better. You do better not because of natural talent or aptitude or effort, yeah, you do better initially just because you're bigger and you're more developed. You're nearly a year older than the kid next to you, yeah. and at age four or five, that developmental difference is monumental. Yeah, and so you do better, and because you do better, the next le level up. Well, maybe you put on the elite team. Maybe they take all the best players and put them on a single team. Maybe yeah. you get better coaching. Maybe eventually you're you're split into an elite league. And now you get better facilities and you mm -hmm. play tougher competition and you get better coaching and better equipment. Um, and because of this initial, it looks to be a matter of luck. Like you have no control over what month you're born. Yeah. That's just a you know, lottery of life. That's just something yet we don't control. Yeah. Because of this initial factor of luck, it snowballs all over time and you end up with this unjust distribution. I say unjust because it's not based just on effort, right? Yeah. It's based on luck. And what they found is that that's also true with education. 
Mm -hmm. If you're the oldest in the class, um, you tend to do better. Um, for males, if you're the youngest in the class, you're more likely to be diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Mm. And it may be because these kids don't have attention deficit disorder. It's because they're 11 months younger than the kid next to them in class. And because yeah. they're the youngest, they have a harder time sitting silently for five, six hours a day. You know, between four and five, that's a big leap. Yeah. And if you're not quite ready for that level of attention for that prolonged period of time, you might get tagged as having some kind of behavioral issue. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's been shown that this happens in terms of economics. It happens in terms of education. These initial inequalities um, don't equal out over time. They compound themselves. Mm -hmm. And so when I was debating Dan Dennett in that other book, Just Desserts, he, he's a compatibilist. He says, I get it. Look, you know, luck matters. You know, we don't we're not all born with the same opportunities or advantages. But then he, he uses this analogy of sports, too. He says, um, well, imagine a race and someone is given a little bit of a head start based on their birthday, a matter of luck. Mm -hmm. Would it be unfair? And then it says, well, it would be unfair if it were a sprint because of the short distance. But mm. life is not like a sprint. It's a marathon. And he says, over the course of life, luck equals out. And, and so that's his response. And I say bullshit to that. Yeah. Um, in fact, all of the empirical data shows the exact opposite. Luck does not equal out over time. Yeah. Those initial social inequities compound themselves over time. And so my part of my solution is that if we're going to successfully deal with criminal justice reform, we can't do so without simultaneously addressing issues of social justice. Yeah. So criminal justice and social justice become much closer aligned. Because if the social determinants of violence, if the social determinants of criminal behavior are things like poverty and low socioeconomic status mm -hmm. and educational inequity and homelessness and lack of access to health care, then the best way to prevent crime is not to punish people on the tail end. It's to um, yeah. address those social inequities to level the playing field so that people have an equal opportunity to compete. Yeah. Um, so prevention and social justice become the, the focus of my model rather than the punitive response to crime on the tail. And now I also have another thing based on my quarantine analogy, but we could talk about yeah. that. Later. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. Like, uh, yeah, because I was just about to start talking to you like about some of these solutions, right? And and here's here's just a quick rant from me because I feel I feel like there's a lot of the polar polarizing topics. It's because people can't agree on the definitions. And last year, you know, you heard all the defund the police and stuff like that. Like with someone who comes from a mental health background, my girlfriend's in, you know, she's uh, in a uh, master's program for social work. What I hear is, hey, a little less go after people with mental illness, with cops, yeah. with guns, bring in some mental health professionals, yeah. have a little bit more community policing and stuff like that, right? It's just kind of redistributing how our funds are spent, right? So so then we're acknowledging that not every person with, you know, uh, a, a drug addiction, a mental health problem needs to be put in a cell. And now, and like you were mentioning, how these things compound, right? Like once you once you go into a jail cell and, you know, they take your fingerprints, they put you in the system and all that, it can just get worse, right? You're in that yeah, revolving hard, door. Hard to get out. Yeah. yeah. So, and so, so there's a lot of solutions. I talk about a lot of them in the book. And I also address the cost argument, which some people worry that, you know, this kind of approach would cost more. It actually ends up saving more. Yeah. Uh, but just education, for example, often in offering education in prisons, um, you end up saving um, $5 for every dollar you spend. Mm. So every dollar we spend to offer college education to prisoners it ends up saving us $5 when you factor in things like property loss, mm. court, court fees, um, the cost of incarceration, um, and it reduces recidivism by itself by 40%. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is things like, um, there are what are called um, de-escalation sites. So some, some, some municipalities have, have tried to do this, like, train police officers um, that when they arrive at a crime scene to assess things beyond just, you know, um, whether a crime has been committed, whether someone should be booked, but is this person suffering from a mental illness? Is this the result of, is this dispute somehow the result of the fact that 
they don't have stable housing or lack of, of health. And then to try to um, bring them to services that could address those needs rather than bringing them into the criminal mm -hmm. justice system. So if I arrive and I see that this dispute is, is, and this person is clearly suffering from mental illness, rather than booking them and then say, well, they'll get help in the system, which rarely they do. Yeah. And once you bring them into the system, it often exasperates their mental illnesses because they they don't have access to their treatment. Um, often it could just compound um, um, issues of stress that could make yeah. their, their conditions worse. To bring them to what are sometimes called de-escalation centers, mm. where you have experts, mental health experts, drug treatment experts, people who could address the needs of the individual, try to figure out what the underlying problem is yeah. and deal with it before the individual gets in, um, brought into the system. And they've been quite effective. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll just say is like, so as a free will skeptic, people say, well, what do you do with serial killers and child molesters? I mean, and I, my argument is that we're not going to just let them run free. So I have this analogy where I say, um, well, imagine, you know, imagine I come to talk to you in person and I want to visit Vegas and somehow along the way I contract Ebola mm. um, or nowadays COVID, right? Yeah. Um, and so I get out of the airport and they test me and I test positive, right? Well, I haven't done anything morally wrong. I don't deserve punishment. The, you know, retribution doesn't seem justified in this case. But I think everyone would agree that we are justified in quarantining that individual. And mm -hmm. the justification for quarantining them is not punitive. It's not punishment. It's not retribution. It has nothing to do with free will and moral responsibility. It's based on public safety. Yeah. And yeah. in my model, it's based on the right of self-defense and prevention of harm to others. And then so the argument is that by analogy, we could argue that serial killers, child molesters, people who pose a serious threat to the safety of other individuals um, can be incapacitated on a justification grounded in the right of self-defense and prevention of harm to others, analogous to the justification we have for quarantine. Mm -hmm. So when I first proposed this model, people didn't have any experience with quarantine. <laughs> and so sort of a, now almost everyone has yeah. some experience with quarantine. And so the idea, though, is that we often have cases where we could limit individual liberty for reasons other than punitive reasons. Yeah. And one good case is just what we do in, in terms of public health institutions. We were allowed to justify quarantining the Ebola patient as so as to prevent a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not because they are evil. It's not because they did anything wrong. It's not because they're blameworthy or they deserve punishment. It's simply a matter of, of, of public safety. Yeah. And so my argument would be um, that we could adopt that kind of approach for those that need to be incapacitated. But also, you have to know a couple of really important reforms follow. One is that um, this is a non, not only a non-retributive approach, it's a non-punitive approach. It's not punishment at all. We don't punish the Ebola patient mm -hmm. when we quarantine them. By no common definition, this is punishment. And secondly, you can't treat them cruelly. I can't, I could justify quarantining you. Mm -hmm. But I can't justify stripping you of your basic human rights, demoralizing you, de-enfranchising you, you know, dehumanizing you, uh, taking away your voting rights, stripping you yeah. of your ability to speak with loved ones. No, you're supposed to retain all of those rights. The only right you're really limited in is liberty. And that's only necessary so long as you pose a threat to society. So on my model, the purpose of the criminal justice system would be to rehabilitate and reintegrate individuals. We would also have to adopt what I call the principle of least infringement. You have to adopt the least restrictive measure possible, consistent with, pub with protecting public safety. So we don't quarantine people for the common cold. And for yeah. good reason. We accept a certain amount of risk mm. in society. We, we accept that, you know, yeah, if I sneeze on you and you get sick, I've caused you some harm. But we restrict quarantine for these really radical cases, these really extreme cases, these ones that pose significant public health risks, like irreversible harms, like death. Yeah. Um, and so what I would say is the vast majority of re the vast majority of people that we currently incarcerate, um, we could better deal with with alternatives that yeah. we don't need incarceration. So let me let me let me ask you this. Like, like, for example, I would be in favor of legalizing, you know, recreational marijuana. That's I what I was going to. Yeah. Of um, um, providing alternatives to incarceration for people with mental health needs, mm -hmm. with addiction problems. Um, 
low level crimes can often be better dealt with um, with parole or supervision um, or some kind of monitoring that in incarceration should be the last resort. And it should only be for those really sort of, you know, seriously violent crimes that can't be, that we can't successfully protect people uh, by other means. Yeah. And then the, the, the last thing is that, um, you know, the, the, we have a moral duty to treat you when, when we quarantine you with Ebola or with COVID and then release you the minute you're no longer a threat. Mm -hmm. I lose any further justification for limiting your liberty the minute you're no longer a threat to public uh, health. And I would say the same with, with incarceration. We should not be keeping people longer than is necessary to protect society. And too much of what we find in our current you know, system is with this punitive approach, especially with this retributive approach, we think such a serious crime, proportionality requires a lengthy sentence, let's say. Um, but people are aging out in prison. Yeah. And, and statistics show that after a certain age, the chances of recidivism drop dramatically. And they almost drop to zero at a yeah. certain point. People who are 65 and 75 years of, of age pose very, very, most of them, vast majority of them, very, very little threat of, of, of uh, recidivism with violent crime. Yeah. And so a retributivist could justify keeping them in prison because they deserve it. The crime they committed somehow deems they need such a, you know, life in prison. Yeah. Uh, Whereas on my model, um, it would it would drastically reduce the number of people, and it would drastically uh, affect this mass incarceration crisis because the vast majority of individuals don't pose a significant enough threat on my model to justify incapacitation. Yeah. But I just want to say, I also want us to not myopically be obsessed with punishment. I understand we have to deal with certain people who end up committing serious crime. But I do want to shift the focus to prevention and social justice, yeah. which is not what the other approaches tend to do. Yeah, yeah. And I, I I just often wonder because there's so many debates, just every other thing, you know, about like policies. It's like, where the money, the money, the money. And like, I'm just like, do, do people not understand how much money is going into our prison system? Like, yeah. do they not get it? Right. So billion a year. Yeah. 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 Like somebody, somebody gets pulled over for having some weed. Like, so here in Nevada, we legalized yeah. it. So you don't really got to, you know, worry about that. But, but yeah, it's like when we're putting people in here and just all the money getting funneled in there. But, but one of my last questions for you, because I want to end on a light note. I'm curious is like, like, I'm not sure how involved in like policy you are, or I don't know if policy makers have grabbed copies of your book, but like, is there anything on the horizon uh, or, or are there like education, like things going out there where we can educate communities on, Hey, punishment isn't always the answer. This stuff is not working. Like yeah. what, what, like, what's the light at the end of the tunnel, Greg, help me out. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, I work a lot with people who, who are trying to affect policy. My goal is obviously to affect policy. Yeah. So one of the things I do is I co-direct a network called the Justice Without Retribution Network. Um, and it tries to bring together philosophers, mm. neuroscientists, criminologists, lawyers, judges, politicians to look at um, non-retributive alternatives to addressing criminal behavior, ones that are ethically defensible, practically workable. Mm -hmm. um, I've been invited to speak to, you know, uh, groups of judges and lawyers in the past. And very interestingly, I've been quite receptive to, to, mm. to the idea. Um, I do notice a difference in reaction when I'm speaking in, in Europe than when I'm speaking in the US. There seems in some cases there's almost, well, we already do this, or this just seems obvious. Yeah. And in the US, sometimes you get like, well, this is just unrealistic. And, and, um, and so you get really dramatically different kind of reactions to it. Um, but I, I, you know, I was recently um, spoke with the leading policy person for the Democratic Alliance, the second biggest political party in South Africa, who's very interested mm. in this kind of criminal justice reform. Um, mm. So the hope is that more and more people begin to um, both understand that our current systems are not working. Yeah. They don't produce the outcomes we desire, they're not making us safer, but also philosophically, I want us to also realize that they're unjustified in many cases. Yeah. When you really look at it, crime is more a byproduct of circumstances than individual responsibility. Yeah. And the, the quicker we could see that, the more we'll be able to reorient ourselves to addressing the systemic causes. I mean, my, my broader belief is that once we abandon the belief in free will, 
and abandon with it the pernicious notions of just deserves. Um, we'll be more able to look in, you know, deeply into the systems that shape individuals um, and that will allow us to adopt more effective and more humane practices and policies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the easiest ways to do it is not all of these complicated arguments against free will based on determinism or indeterminism, but I think people are more capable of seeing the luck issue. Yeah. That when you really show them that, imagine just one or two things going different in your lives. You know, like we've all got, you know, like you mentioned your past, but we've all done things in our past. Yeah. And just the fact that you get caught and someone else doesn't get caught could change someone's whole course of life. Mm -hmm. Or there's this book, The Two Michael Moores, um, who's this political pundit. Um, is it Mike? Not Michael Moore. Um, the Two West Moores, Westmore, um, who talks about the fact that he grew up in an inner city, I think it's Chicago. Mm. And there was another guy in his, in his town with the same name, you know, the, you know, the other Westmore. Um, and he talks about how the other person fell into drugs and then got into gangs and then mm. spent their lives in and out of prison. And how he escaped it by first joining the military and then getting um, into politics. And then eventually now he's a talking head on cable and stuff. Um, and part of what you realize is it's so easy that you were that other West Moore. That is, it's just a matter of a few bad breaks going in one direction. And your whole course of life could have been different. Not yeah. because of who you are, your moral principles, but because of luck. Yeah. Like one thing I often think about, and this is very precedent when you think about Afghanistan and some of the conflicts around the world, um, is we tend to want to condemn people. Like we say, you know, look at that 16 year old with a machine gun committing crimes and, and, and uh, you know, engaging in, in tribal, you know, violence. Yeah. Um, but then I think, well, what would you do if you were a 16 year old with no source of income? Yeah you had two options in life, jump on the back of that pickup and start killing one group of people or jump on the back of the other pickup and start killing a different group of people or try to remain neutral and have your hands cut off, watch your sister and, and mother raped and, and assaulted and yeah. abused in front of you. Would you be capable of murder? Would you be capable of committing violence? And I think we too often forget that the circumstances in which we are allowed to be moral yeah. are factors beyond our control. Yeah. And often, if you were to find yourself in those kind of circumstances, you would be just as capable of those acts as the people we want to condemn. Yeah. And so if there's just a little bit of understanding, a little bit of, you know, therefore, but the grace of luck go I. Yeah. Um, we could begin to see from a bigger picture that maybe the right approach isn't always condemnation, but to... And again, I'm not going to let serial killers run free. I'm going to, I still think there's grounds for incapacitating them. Yeah. Um, but the idea is also not to just take a punitive approach, but to try to give us a more holistic approach that sees individuals as embedded in social systems yeah. and then tries to address those social injustices, correct those social systems so as to produce better outcomes. Yeah, I think it, there is hope for that. I just, I, you know, I'm going to keep on working. For yeah, that. yeah, a, a, absolutely. And that, you know, the last thing I'll say, like as you were talking about that, the luck factor, and just one little thing, like something that really clicked for me. Like, I, I, I try to be grateful for my, you know, my terrible experience as a drug addict because I can look back on it and realize how lucky. I was like, they just released the numbers, 93,000 people died of overdose, you know, that could have yeah. been me. But the other thing too, like when you're talking about like, uh, you know, we've all done like, you know, it, things illegal, right? Like I have driven all over Las Vegas, blackout drunk, not one DUI, but a DUI can screw up your entire life. I have an old roommate from college. He got a DUI, lost his license. We had to drive him and limited what jobs he can get and all sorts of stuff. And I, I used to think that because I don't have a DUI and I've never been in an accident, therefore I'm not as bad as other people, right? Yeah. And and that's that false idea of you know control or the just world and yeah. all that stuff. But when I realized like, no, I just got lucky as hell. So it helps me be a little bit more understanding and realize like, hey, I just got the luck of the draw and realize that some people just, you know, didn't. So I don't know. I I love the work that you're doing and I'm trying to figure out how to educate more people about this stuff too. But but yeah, so you you got a couple books out and I'm curious, are you working on anything new? Where's the best place for people to to find you if they're interested 
Yeah, so the two, new, the two new books are Rejecting Retributivism. It's Free Will, Punishment, and Criminal Justice is the subtitle. Um, that's available everywhere, Amazon. There should be a paperback edition coming right. out in, within the next couple of weeks. Um, and then the other book this, that just came out, both of these are 2021 books, is called Just Desserts, Debating Free Will. And that's where uh, me and Dan Dennett, um, another famous philosopher, debate our, our respective views on free will and punishment. Um, I'm always working on papers. I, I'm mm. working on a number of different responses, criticisms of my theory. Nice. Uh, so that should be coming out in the Journal of Legal Philosophy. But I'm also just uh, thinking about talking to publishers about another book on, on punishment. Mm. Um, so hopefully that'll be started soon and maybe within a year or so, hopefully I'll get that finished. I would love it. And and real quick, you mentioned uh, Justice Without Retributivism. Do, does yeah. there a website for that? Like, so, like, because I kind of want to Well, you can find my it. personal website, which is uh, www.gregcaruso.com. Um, it's spelled G-R-E-G-G-C-A-R-U-S-O. Um, and on my website, you can find links to almost all my published works. Beautiful. And there are links to the books and everything else. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So I'm going to link all that stuff. I'm going to link your Twitter because you're pretty active on there. That's how I got a hold of you. But yeah, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Greg. You thank helped you. me. You helped me have a little hope in all this. So I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs>